The biggest leak in the history of data journalism just went live, and it's about corruption. That's what NSA whistleblower Edward Snowden tweeted about the Panama Papers. Released Sunday, they reveal how the rich and powerful in numerous countries use tax havens to hide their wealth. Some 11.5 million files were leaked from one of the world's most secretive offshore companies, Mossack Fonseca, a law firm based in Panama. The documents were obtained from an anonymous source by the German newspaper Süddeutsche Zeitung and shared with the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. The information in the files dates back to 1977 and goes up to December of last year. The revelations implicate 12 heads of state and a number of other politicians, their family members and close associates, including friends of Russian President Vladimir Putin, relatives of the prime ministers of Britain, Iceland and Pakistan, and the president of Ukraine. Relatives of at least eight current former members of China's top ruling body are also named, and today Chinese news groups were ordered to purge all mention of the Panama Papers. This is one of the lead authors of the Panama Papers, Bastian Obermeyer of Süddeutsche, of Süddeutsche Zeitung, talking about the leaks. A small Panamanian law firm that almost no one has heard of is at the center of our research, Mossack Fonseca. Mossack Fonseca guarded the data of the world's most powerful and dangerous people. Until our source passed that on to us, that was about a year ago. I've never seen the source in person. We've been talking to each other via an encrypted chat. I've very openly asked him why he's doing this. He says he thinks they have to stop what they're doing, and he thinks they're doing rotten business. He wants to stop it. In a written statement immediately following the revelations, Mossack Fonseca said allegations have provided a structure designed to hide the source of money were, quote, completely unsupported and false, and that, quote, we do not provide beneficiary services to deceive banks. It's difficult not to say impossible not to provide banks with the identity of final beneficiaries and the origin of funds, they said. So far, fallout from the leaks has prompted investigations and calls for resignation. On Monday, one of the largest protests in Iceland's history demanded that the prime minister, Sigmundur Gunnlaugsson, step down after the leaked files revealed he and his wife were hiding investments worth millions of dollars behind a secretive offshore company. More than 10,000 demonstrators gathered outside the parliament building in Reykjavik. I'm just protesting like the rest of the nation, it appears. What are you protesting? Uh, I would like the prime minister to resign. To talk more about the leaks, we're joined now by two guests. In Munich, Germany, Frederick Obermeyer is co-author of Panama Papers. He is an investigative reporter at Germany's leading newspaper, the Munich-based Süddeutsche Zeitung. He is co-author of the book Panama Papers, the story of a worldwide revelation that was just released today in Germany. Here in New York, Michael Hudson joins us, senior editor at the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, which published the Panama Papers. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Let us begin uh, with Frederick Obermeyer in Munich, Germany. Talk about how your paper got the biggest leak in journalism history. Um, good morning. Um, about one year ago, an anonymous source turned to Süddeutsche Zeitung asking us, hey, hello, I am John Doe, interested in data. And we, uh, of course, said, yes, we are interested in data. And it turned out that this uh, data, internal uh, data of the Panamanian law firm Mossack Fonseca. And we started investigating this data, and it grew and it grew, and we realized that this data is by far too much uh, for, for us. We, we started uh, to investigate it as a team of two. And as we are members of ICIJ, we realized we have to share this material with our partners, because this uh, story is a worldwide story. And talk about what started to be revealed. I mean, 11 and a half million uh, <clears throat> documents is astounding. And why this is called, um, this leak, the Panama Papers? This leak is uh, called the Panama Papers because uh, the documents are from the Panamanian law firm uh, Mossack Fonseca. It's a law firm that is headquartered in Panama but has branches all around the world. And they are offering um, offshore companies to their customers, to banks, to lawyers and end customers. And 
what we see now, I mean, uh, offshore company was like a wall. We couldn't see inside uh, before. And now we have insight through this data. We see which people are the uh, ultimate beneficial owners of uh, offshore companies, which people are using them to hide crime, which using them are to obviously um, evade taxes. Mm. So let's go to some specific examples. Uh, we just said in our lead that the there are increasing calls for the prime minister of Iceland to resign. Ten thousand people gathered in downtown Reykjavik yesterday. Why is he being targeted? What did you learn through this document release? We learned that uh, the Icelandic prime minister uh, was the co-owner of an offshore company called Wintris, and he owned it with his later wife, um, um, yeah, his later wife. But he didn't declare it to public. And this uh, offshore company, Wintris, uh, was in the possession of bonds of the major three Icelandic banks. This, that was the bank that corrupted during the uh, financial crisis. And, I mean, this would have been something what he should have declared to the public, that, hey, I'm, as a politician, I have to deal with uh, what has happened in, during the financial crisis, and, but I do have bonds, and I had bonds in these um, uh, banks via my offshore company. But he didn't declare it to public. So we saw yesterday uh, what the Icelandic population thinks about it, or a majority or parts of it, because there have been thousands gathering uh, in Reykjavik asking him to resign. Michael Hudson, you're with the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. Um, uh, before we go into how you got involved um, with this German newspaper and the extent of this massive government, uh, document leak, um, talk further about Iceland and about this prime minister and what, how that is an example of what you've discovered. Right. Um, you know, when he, when the, the prime minister, when he entered uh, parliament, in, in uh, 2009, uh, as, a, as a member of parliament, uh, he owned this company. He didn't declare it. By the end of the year, in 2009, he had sold it to his wife for a dollar. Um, you know, this was at a time when he was um, really taking up the cause of, of in, in his words, you know, to protect uh, Icelanders from foreign uh, uh, vultures who were trying to, you know, pick through the remains of the, of the, of the crash banks and, and, and profit. Um, and um, what what people didn't know was that he was was as, as Frederick said he he and his wife or, or certainly his wife owned uh, millions of dollars worth of bonds in these banks so uh, it's unclear whether or not the political positions he took benefited or, or hurt you know his family's holdings but the the, the key was that that it, he never reported there was no disclosure. And talk about how um, your organization, the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, worked with this German newspaper. Right. Uh, you know, uh, the great thing about ICIJ is uh, we've been able to gather— What is it? Uh, ICIJ is a, is a U.S.-based, uh, nonprofit uh, uh, news organization. We uh, have a small number of, of full-time staffers, about 11 or 12. 12 folks here in the U.S., Costa Rica, Spain, Venezuela. Uh, but we also have 190 members around the world who work at places like The Guardian, the BBC, and, and, and other newspapers and, and uh, broadcast organizations around the world. And, you know, our, uh, we have an extraordinary group of people who work with us who really embrace something that a lot of journalists don't embrace, a couple things, uh, teamwork and patience. This idea that you're going to share information with with people that normally you would consider your competitors, uh, but the key is is we all agree to do so and we all agree to publish at the same time, uh, which which is really a win-win. We're able to sort of in a sense do sort of journalistic crowdsourcing on this on these giant data sets like the Panama Papers, and when there's a public and when when, we, when everyone publishes, you're not publishing by yourself. You have some protection if you're in a country where where uh, media can be can be silenced, but also it just it creates this sort of international firestorm as as we've seen. I mean, this is massive. This was the New York Times involved? They've given this very little coverage. Um, th they've written about it, but uh, some. Um, there's a piece on the Iceland minister today. Right, right. Um, 
Uh, but we see lots of other me media, including The Washington Post and, and other folks, are, are sort of jumping on this and have been sort of forced to, to deal with this. What to you is the biggest story that you've—that um, have been revealed in these 11 and a half million files? Well, I, I think the, the, the biggest story is the world leaders, and, it, and it's, you know, we have a dozen world leaders uh, who the documents show uh, actually controlled personally controlled offshore assets or were involved in all sorts of transactions. But the other part of it is, is we have dozens of people who were uh, either family members or associates of world leaders. Uh, name names. Well, one name would be uh, people very close to, to Russian President Vladimir Putin. Uh, uh, longtime friends, friends going back to his boyhood, uh, business associates, uh, even the uh, 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 the godfather of, of Putin's eldest daughter. And they essentially have formed a, a network where they're trading among themselves. They, 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 they have various degrees of control over offshore companies and over large, secretly uh, have influence over large uh, Russian corporations. And we, we've seen as yeah, the records themselves show as much as uh, $2 billion being shuffled back and forth. The cellist and, Sergei um, Rod Roldugin. Exactly. This is, this is a man who, who says he has, you know, no, no finan finance background. He, he, he's not, he has no fortune, but yet uh, the records show, tell a different story. They show that, that he, uh, he has uh, connections to and, in some cases, control of assets worth millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, the center of a scheme in which money um, from the Russian state banks is hidden offshore, uh, some of it ending up in a ski resort, where, in 2013, Putin's daughter, uh, Katerina, got married. Right. Um, talk about Bashar al-Assad in Syria. Uh, Bashar al-Assad, the leader in Syria. Um, right. His two cousins, Rami and Hafez yes. uh, Makhlouf, who've been the target of international sanctions, suspected of controlling key gateways to Syria's oil and telecom business. Uh, yes, there, there, there are people connected to him. Also, what we've seen is that uh, companies that have been busting the, the international embargo against Syria uh, and, and supplying fuel that was used to keep Sears Air Force helicopters and airplanes uh, in the air. Uh, uh, these are craft that were used to bomb, bomb his own citizens. And, and uh, Mossack Fonseca was representing, uh, working with the companies that were, were busting these sanctions. And explain exactly um, what this company is in Panama, it, Mossack it's, Fonseca. It, it's a law firm. But it, but it's really is you know its main business is really as an incorporator of offshore companies. It's headquartered in it's it's headquartered in, in Panama City, but it has uh, offices in in Miami, Zurich, Hong Kong, more than 35 places around the world. I think they they have eight offices total in in, in China. Uh, this is an international organization that specializes in selling secrecy. And secrecy is something that, that's bought and sold. And the more secrecy, the, 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 the deeper secrecy, the more levels of, of protection, of insulation you want, the more you'll pay. Um, Argentine President Frederick Obermeyer, Argentine President Maurizio Macri, uh, the man that President Obama just went to visit in Argentina. While mayor of Buenos Aires uh, is revealed in these files, Macri did not disclose his position as director of a company which was incorporated in the Bahamas in 1998. Right. Yes, that was a very interesting case for us, because he was a, uh, another world leader, a current world le leader of a big country worldwide. And for us, I mean, we found him really at a late stage of this investigation. But for us, it was very interesting, because that was the time when he became the new president of Argentina. So for us, it was very important to have a deeper look into this case. Mm. Um, also listed um, in this grouping of individuals involved is the British Prime Minister, David Cameron. Frederick Obermeyer, talk more about what you found. I mean, David Cameron is not uh, in the data uh, himself, but there's actually his father in this data, and he's involved in a structure that involved bearer shares. And that's, for me, that was very interesting, because um, it's actually David Cameron now who is uh, 
uh, asking for and who pushes for um, getting rid of structures that involve bearer shares, and it was actually his father using such structures. So, as we today, we, there was a huge debate in London, and we heard from our correspondent in London that that's actually the topic number one in Great Britain. Well, that's this issue of the British government facing criticism of uh, Cameron after his late father's name appeared in the Panama Papers leak. Labour leader Jeremy Corbyn said today he'll publish his tax returns and urged other ministers to do the same. This is what he said. High time that we got tough on tax havens. Britain has a huge responsibility, because many of those tax havens are in British overseas territories or Crown dependencies. The leaked documents show tax havens have become honeypots of international corruption, tax avoidance and tax evasion. They are sucking revenues out of our own country and many others, fueling inequality, shortchanging our services and our people. The government needs to go beyond warm words on tax dodging. There cannot be one set of tax rules for the wealthy elite and another for the rest of us. The unfairness and abuse must stop. So I say this to the government and to the Chancellor, no more lip service. The richest must pay their way. So that is Jeremy Corbyn, uh, the Labour leader in Britain, as uh, David Cameron is coming under uh, criticism, the Prime Minister. Uh, Frederick Obermeyer, what about in Germany itself? In Germany, we have had our uh, finance minister calling for more transparency uh, in the world, in the world of offshore. But that's actually quite funny, because it was our finance minister uh, doing the same and asking for the same in the year 2013, uh, after we and ICAJ and all the partners uncovered the offshore leaks. So this is another example for me of politicians, high-profile politicians, um, asking for transparency, but that then not pushing enough to get this measure. Uh, into practice. Mm. And Michael Hudson, more on world leaders. Right. You know, it, it, we've seen uh, uh, quite a few world leaders who have spoke out against corruption, uh, uh, including uh, Ukrainian President uh, Petro Poroshenko, uh, China's uh, top leader. Uh, those folks have been connected to to uh, offshore entities. Poroshenko was shown during the the armed conflict with with Russia. Uh, his his uh, uh, representatives were were setting up an offshore. A company for him at that time. Uh, you know, the, uh, information now being blocked in China around what's been discovered. Absolutely. Um, and, and that's sort of a pattern. In, in previous, uh, previous uh, investigations, when we've written about the offshore holdings of China's elite, China has, has shut us down. But it's interesting, um, uh, there are sort of, sort of uh, freedom of information activists, what they'll do is they, they will take our—what they've done in the past is they've taken our stories and turned them into to impossible to search PDFs so they can be emailed around the country and, and, and beat the blockade. Frederick Obermeyer, among the people identified as Alam Mubarak, the son of Hosni Mubarak, the longtime dictator uh, forced out a few years ago in the Arab Spring in Egypt. Yes, and that's for me. That's a very interesting case because um, this case shows how the uh, Panamanian law from Panam uh, Mustak Fonseca deals with sanctioned individuals. Because we see in the data that they actually realize that. Um, it was Allah Mubarak, so the son of Hosni Mubarak, um, who is in the data, and that he was sanctioned, but they still kept him, uh, his company active for a, uh, for a time. And that's something we see uh, in, in different cases in the data. I mean, Mossack Fonseca always claims, and they told us, for example, one year ago when we asked them for another story, if they are dealing with sanctioned individuals or companies, and they told us, no, we would not accept them as customers. But what we do see now in the data is that they do actually accept, accept them. For example, we found a conversation um, between several partners of this uh, law firm, and they spoke about uh, Rami Makhlouf, the cousin of uh, Bashar al-Assad. 
And I mean, they realized that he was the cousin, and they realized that he is, uh, was sanctioned, and they realized that he is uh, claimed to, or allegedly, one of the financiers of the uh, Syrian regime. And they said, oh, there's this bank who still does business with him, so we should still uh, keep with him as well. And I think that really shows how scrupulous they are, because, I mean, they, are de they dealt with a person that was sanctioned and that was involved uh, with an, a regime that is killing thousands. Uh, in Syria. We're going to break and then come back to this discussion with Frederick Obermeyer, co author of the Panama Papers story, investigative reporter at Germany's leading newspaper, the Munich based Süddeutsche Zeitung. He is co author of the book Panama Papers, a story of a worldwide revelation just released today in Germany. And with us in New York, Michael Hudson, senior editor at the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, or ICAJ, which published the Panama Papers. This is Democracy Now! We'll be back with them in a minute.